Hello and welcome to the debate. I'm your host, Anam Apoor, with you at PTV World. In today's show, we will be taking a look at two important stories. The first is uh, with reference to what is going on within the country and, of course, particularly uh, with regards to the PTI's leadership and the former Prime Minister Imran Khan and the number of cases that have been going on against him. And uh, as we have seen before, uh, the uh, PTI chairman failed to appear before the court once again. He was scheduled to appear before uh, the courts today uh, and he did not appear. And because of that, uh, there have been uh, non bailable arrest warrants that have been issued against him in two cases, one pertaining to the Zosha Khana reference and the other to the judge threatening case. And uh, this, of course, means that uh, moving forward, this perhaps will be a more complicated situation than in the past. But we have previously also seen that a team of the Islamabad police uh, went to Lahore to arrest him earlier this month and unfortunately came back empty handed. And because of that, there are serious question marks as to what exactly is now going to happen with these non bailable arrest warrants as well and how uh, these cases are going to proceed. There have been, of course, pleas filed uh, by the uh, PTI leadership in both the Lahore High Court and the Islamabad High Court regarding these. Uh, issues and the matter of court appearances citing security threats as the reason uh, for the failure of appearance before the court, uh, something that has been challenged in the courts uh, by the judges claiming the fact that the security uh, with regards to uh, conducting rallies uh, within Lahore and with regards to holding election campaigns is not a matter uh, of concern, but when it comes to appearing before the court, uh, this seems to be a problem. And there's also uh, the uh, in, uh, perception and the statements coming in from the judiciary uh, that uh, perhaps uh, the PTI chairman has been taking the courts and the relief that has been given to him for granted and he's not the uh, first or the only uh, ex-prime minister to be called before the courts. And so we're going to try and explore what exactly this means uh, in terms of these particular cases, uh, the way that they are going to proceed and then of course the impact that this will have on the PTI chairman. We're also going to be discussing in our second segment uh, the developing international dynamics for particularly after the thawing of relationship between Saudi Arabia and Iran, a surprise announcement that came in on Friday last. And we heard that this is, of course, uh, something that is going to shape uh, the, uh, the regional dynamics and the political situation. There has been a time frame of two months that both the parties have given each other to develop this further. But it remains to be seen uh, what sort of a scenario uh, this is going to evolve. Uh, of course, uh, there is the matter that uh, the uh, Middle East and uh, perhaps this region is uh, becoming more independent of uh, any sort of foreign policy decisions or diplomacy uh, uh, devoid of uh, the West. But exactly how will these dynamics unfold, particularly um, in terms of <coughs> uh, the role that China has played in this uh, particular agreement and how uh, this relationship is going to proceed, whether or not there can be or there possibly will be any sort of return to how things were back in the 90s or if not, what sort of new dynamic are we looking towards uh, with reference to the relationship between both these countries and of course then the larger region as well. That is going to be the focus of our second segment of the show today. For this and more, as always in the studios, I've been joined by senior analyst Farooq Qadhafi. We've also been joined online by our guest Barrister Safi Ghori, who's a legal expert and political analyst. We've also been joined by Mr. Osama Khabar Kum who's the law professor at LUMS and Advocate High Court of Pakistan. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Osama, for joining us and being a part of the debate. Um, let me start with you, Barasa Safi. The situation with regards to uh, what we have seen in the number of cases against the ex-prime minister uh, is that uh, the, uh, the failure to appear before the court is uh, something that has become typical of his behavior. But uh, we have seen that perhaps and we discussed this earlier too, that maybe the courts are now losing patience. There is the issuance of non bailable arrest warrants that have uh, been issued. But uh, what do you think it means in terms of mm, the options and possibilities available to the ex-prime minister? Because in the past, the non bailable arrest warrants have also been issued. Uh, and yet it seems that uh, there was a way that he could get away from it. Right. Thank you very much, uh, Sana. S the law is very clear. Under Section 75 CRPC, uh, subsection 2, it is clearly stated that in case a non bailable arrest warrant is issued, it can only be cancelled by the court of issuance upon the production of the accused or upon its execution. So we know for a fact that there is no way out. Now, there was a lacuna, the one final lacuna that Imran Khan could have used, which is to get a transitory bail from the High Court. That is what he utilized. He went to the Islamabad High Court, appealed before Justice Amir Farooq, 
and he was given a transitory bail until the 13th of march which is today to appear before the honorable uh, court in islamabad and he did not now that the transitory bail that was granted on imran khan's request and upon his guarantee that he will come by the 13th of march and the fact that he still has not leaves absolutely no legal option this is why we know that islamabad police had to send a helicopter to his arrest and you know well, we don't know where he was i don't understand why he was not arrested even though there was uh, every reason to arrest him today that is that is the case in uh, in the case of uh, what you call it the tosha khana indictment case which has been going on for a while and then in the other case uh, currently for the uh, for uh, hurling abuses and threatening a judge which was uh, a non bailable arrest warrants were issued by justice rana mujahid rahim he is a very honorable judge i have appeared before him many times myself and i know him to be a very reasonable and a very generous judge and we have clearly seen in this case that he has given imran khan dozens i do not say one dozen i say multiple dozens of opportunities and even before arresting these arrest warrants non bailable arrest warrants rana mujahid rahim gave him several warnings consistently asking him to come and since that was also disregarded the court had absolutely no way left but to issue non bailable arrest warrants now in both cases pti has a very strange stance and the stance says that he is under a threat and because he is under a threat he cannot appear before the court this threat of sorts is not preventing him from holding rallies it is not preventing him from going out in public it is not preventing him from having hordes of people come to zaman park to his house but for some reason it is preventing him from entering the premises of the special courts islamabad which are by the way the most secure courts because this is where the anti terrorism courts are this is where high profile terrorists are brought in where there is a serious threat from other terrorist organizations and we have seen that even those terrorist organizations have not been able to penetrate these courts yet imran khan continues to plead that his his life is in danger and somehow uh, says that you know even benazir was murdered benazir was not murdered when she was appearing before a court in fact the fact that even though benazir was assassinated her own husband president zadari continued to attend the courts he did not make an excuse saying that his wife was assassinated and therefore now he could be assassinated or for that matter uh, we have also seen in, in the case of former prime minister nawaz sharif we have seen in the case of uh, saf dar and many many other leaders how all of them have appeared before any and every court that there is in islam in pakistan and yet we see imran khan not willing to just complete straight out refusing giving the most absurd reasons to not appear before the court uh, going so far as to say that it is unfair that he is being called to the court and he being the former prime minister uh, uh, so i th- just, we, just a clarification that the issue of the transitory bail that you were referring to is there no possibility of any extension in that i i feel like if there was to be an extension they should have applied for the extension today before the islamabad high court now that the time has run out they could have they could have said that the the transit the transitory bail period is to run out today they could have gone to the court and pleaded for extra, uh, extraordinary circumstances said that the transitory bail be extended for uh, you know whatever reasons there are but they did not even bother appealing before the islamabad high court hmm. so right. i i don't really see where they can go now i i honestly would be very surprised if uh, any further leeway is given and yet unfortunately we we do see that the courts seem to have a very soft corner towards the former prime minister imran khan and right, uh, <laughs> right. and, and, and we will talk more about that uh, but let me also uh, include in the discussion mr usama and uh, usama the issue of course uh, with reference to what is being cited as the reason of the failure of appearing before the courts is the issue of security threats and as barrister safi was talking about Uh, and what has been discussed in the courts as well is that uh, this is not something that's stopping him from conducting rallies or running an election campaign i want to understand uh, what sort of uh, a substance or weightage will this argument hold in the legal proceedings and whether or not uh, the kind of pleas that have been filed uh, towards uh, allowing him this particular relief uh, will be able to consider this particular argument um, thank you sana for inviting me i think uh, sana we need to just step back and and for a moment think uh this this case into 
terms of ordinary criminal law trial, the principles of trial. So we, we were the way Imran Khan and ex prime minister is being treated as a royalty, uh, and so he's coming up with these absurd pleas, and 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 we are engaged at the moment. The entire country is engaged in this discussion, but whether his pleas are accurate or not. So what we have to understand and step back and see that he's accused in not in one anti-terrorism uh, case and several other criminal cases. So as an accused person, we are very, very much familiar how an accused is treated in this country, not now since colonial times. So all the accused, in fact, if there's a, if there's a case, an ordinary accused, even an FIR is liable, most of the accused persons in this country, they get never, they, can, uh, they get never convicted, but most of the time they spend, they end up spending a significant time in jails. Here's is an accused person in anti-terrorism cases and other cases who is refusing to come to the court, and he's coming up with these absurd pleas that, uh, okay, can judge come to my house? Sometimes he's saying, oh, I need this special sort of. Uh, uh, place where I can come, sometimes it's like, okay, can we do it through the video link? So I, I, I just see this as an absurdity, a mockery of our entire system that he's not being treated, not, and, and I don't, and I don't say just like the rich people have not been, we have, re, in recent past, we have seen how an ex-prime minister, uh, Nawaz Sharif was treated, how a chief minister, Shabash Sharif was treated, and, and one prime minister even was hanged right here. So I don't think there's any any room and the discussion should not revolve around the court should refuse to even consider this argument whether the threats are legitimate or not legitimate he's an accused person he should be apprehended he should be brought before a judge and it is the responsibility of the state to provide to provide protection to every citizen and it is the responsibility of the state of, of the pakistan that if there are any legitimate threats to his life or his body, the state should provide. But the accused has, has right. no basis right. to not appear right. before Someone a court. I'm glad you pointed that out. I'm glad you talked about that because I wanted to understand that further because this is also something that is repeatedly being said by PTI's council that uh, the uh, security needs to be provided for the PTI chairman. But uh, why is this being demanded of the judiciary? Uh, I, I think the uh, uh, provision of security is uh, is a domain of the executive. It's not is It is not judiciary's domain, and and it, it depends on lots of factors. That that is this is a purely and entirely an executive uh, domain. It goes against the established principles of trichotomy of power and separation of powers. The judiciary is not competent, neither it has resources, no, nor it is trained uh, to, to assess what, what sort of threats are these. So I think uh, the state should discharge its responsibility uh, and provide reasonable security, considering that he's a high target, he's an ex-prime minister, so on and so forth. But the accused, if every accused, just, just look at this, Sana, this way, that if every accused, if he's summoned, in court and he says okay look i have these rivalries in in my village for example i come from a village i like people that all the time they say oh, we have these rivals and they know where we have to appear since you have announces publicly what if we go to that court on that day and we get killed or you know someone attacks us so and not to say this doesn't happen but that if if that is the road that we want to take then it should be applicable to all the other accused in, in this country. Right. All right. And I understand your point. Um, Farooq, the issue, of course, uh, regarding uh, the PTI chairman's appearances uh, has always been referred to as something that is uh, being uh, given to him as a special favor or as a relief by the court. And we've seen that uh, in, in a lot of the previous instances uh, that this has been something that is given. And even the, uh, the, uh, so the issues that we have heard coming in from the courts point towards the fact that uh, this is being said that now this is being taken for granted. But how farther, uh, much farther do you think that this can actually be pushed uh, by the PTI chairman? Because he doesn't seem to be understanding that this is an actual relief towards him. It still seems to be, as, as the Savi was saying, uh, something that he thinks is unfair. 
Uh, right, uh, Sana, to answer your question directly, I think he can do it indefinitely. Uh, okay. uh, because uh, apparently they are uh, laboring under the delusion that it is about justice. It is not. It is about tribalism. It is about uh, misdirection. It is also about sin. Uh, let me qualify uh, by giving you a few examples mm -hmm. which are quite interesting. Tosha Khana. Right. Uh, I hope you remember what uh, Tosha Khana case was all about. It was not about... Uh, you know, um, uh, uh, taking any gift given by the, pub, you know, from the public uh, control to your home, it was about something else. It mm. was about misdeclaration, right? But amazingly, whosoever actually, uh, and I'm in awe of Imran Khan's uh, uh, spin master team, uh, whosoever came up with the idea that they will go to LHC and surprise, surprise, they will uh, get the kind of magical relief that was needed also that you also y you declare uh, the entire list right now the discussion and thanks to the uh, second part moving part which is media that the focus has shifted from misdeclaration mm. to who actually got how big up uh, a gift and they kept it right no matter how much money was given and everything so now the discussion becomes about rich versus poor and uh, mm. uh, you know Poor Imran Khan, he's being victimized because look, what is a watch compared to a, a car, right? This is the first amazing misdirection because totally changes the context. The second thing, you're, uh, we are laboring under the delusion that anybody take uh, worries or cares two hoots about the lower judiciary. Nobody does. That's why the poor uh, lower judiciary has been on their receiving end from every bully in the town, right? And that will continue to happen no matter what. No matter how many summons they keep on sending, somebody in the upper courts will actually decide to suspend that. And that's why I'm saying that it will continue indefinitely. Uh, and you, if you have not uh, noticed, what is happening is, and I'm sure that if I had a plot or house in Jaman Park, I would have done exactly the same thing as well. The previous, the last lawyer movement was actually orchestrated by a very good or, uh, and honorable friend, that is Ibzaz Ehsan Saab. And this time he has, he's already priming everybody that if somebody actually files a reference against the CJA or the uh, senior court judges, there should be another lawyer's movement in support of that. Right, despite <laughs> all the problems that we have seen, and uh, because uh, uh, Zaza Hassan Saab is actually next door neighbor of Imran Khan Saab, so that goes without saying that he is going to be sympathetic. But my problem is that in uh, back in 2007, 2008, when we uh, you know followed his example, it was a case of uh, Pied Piper, and we know what exactly did Iftikhar Shari do with the whole system the way he kept on playing it like a banjo, right? Uh, now, there are a couple of other things that also, uh, you know, need your uh, uh, attention. For example, another misdirection. The PTI has this remarkable number of embeds in every channel. And what do they do? Every time you actually focus on the nitty-gritty of the cases that are there, right? What happens? Immediately, the misdirection takes over and they A, start shouting. B, they start actually going for amazing kind of both sidedism. Okay, they did this, the, the other side also is not so pious. And that's why you see what exactly is happening. Amazingly in Pakistan, again, uh, because the judicial system is such that it favors the person who is on the, on the rise, right? Mm. Every time Imran Khan Saab actually is accused of something, Burden, uh, burden of proof lies with the accuser. Every time Imran Khan Saab accuses somebody, the burden of proof <laughs> lies with the accused, mm. right? Uh, let me give you a very simple example. Again, I, I, I'm going to shorten it. No, no, but, okay. uh, but uh, you know, uh, Tyrion uh, Khan's, uh, Tyrion White's case, right? Today, there was uh, this comment from the Islamabad High Court that I was amazed to hear that uh, if you want to prove or disqualify him, first you have to go to the lower courts and there you have to prove the paternity, right? Sirs, you can very easily summon the, the records of cases abroad. Yeah. And you can actually process that. 
or you could have done something. So what what exactly is going to happen now? A, gain time. Khan Saab actually goes to lower courts and it takes ages to prove uh, his paternity or lack thereof. And th then, of course, this comes back to the court who knows who is going to hear that. Secondly, if that doesn't happen, he goes scot-free. Hmm. Despite the fact that there is a case where he has been proven to uh, actually be the father. And then it was not declared. Again, another case of not, uh, you know, uh, 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 any kind of moral turpitude, it is essentially a misdeclaration case. Once again, he does not actually uh, declare that, but he walks free hmm. because that is how things are. Right. So in a sense, I think it is tribalism. Um, I don't like to say this because I've been so aggressively supporting the highest judiciary, but I think tribalism has taken over. All right. Um, Barrister Safi, the issue uh, with regards to how much importance these legal proceedings are going to take, especially in terms of the PTI's leadership and the way it's going to impact uh, the political dynamics is also important because, of course, there's, uh, there is one aspect of uh, what needs to be the legal scenario that we can discuss. But I also want to understand that uh, irrespective of that, if there is no real impact in terms of the court of public opinion or how the uh, politics is going to evolve, uh, then do you think that the, the kind of weightage or importance that needs to be given to these court proceedings um, are not there by the PTI because of this fact? No, on the contrary, Sana, I believe that the use of courts by PTI has been absolutely phenomenal. Like, if you think about it, uh, there's a term that is used, it's called lawfare. Lawfare is the use of law to wage warfare. And that is precisely what PTI has been doing. PTI first came into power because of its successful use of the courts, the Panama Leaks case, uh, the Park Lane case. They eliminated all of their opponents one by one by ensuring that they would have massive cases against them that would not only change the opinion of the public, but also lead to extremely important disqualifications. And recently, in an interview with ARY, Imran Khan stated that now the opposition is looking to do the same thing to him. by They are firing these cases left, right and center all across Pakistan to get him disqualified. Well, if that is the case, then he should also fight them the same way his opponents did. PDM did not back down from those cases. All of the leaders did continue to fight them. They went to jail. They suffered penalties. Many of them were in jail for years before they finally got out. And the same principle should therefore apply to Imran Khan. The, 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 the use of the courts here, whether it is by PDM or whether it is independent, whatever it may be, the reality is that right now, it's the call for justice for PTI. Everyone has had their turn. It's PTI's turn. They need to come and face the music. And if they manage to convince the court otherwise, it's going to help their case more than anything else. But the fact that they are absconding from the court is what's truly disappointing. And I'll, I'll say here, uh, I'll echo the words of the judge of the ATC court before he issued the non-bailable arrest warrants. And he said that Imran Khan whose party stands for Tehreek and Saab, the party of justice, goes around in his rallies giving examples of the West about how the rule of law applies equally to all citizens in the West, how even prime ministers and presidents appear before the court and nobody is beyond them, and how there is such respect for the law that, uh, you know, uh, that, that the rule of law is, is prevalent everywhere and that's what leads to investment contracts and businesses and what and yet we see his own party shouting death to the courts we see his own party members breaking the courts he is attacking the parliament he's attacking the courts he is uh, hurling abuses and assaults and threatening the judges himself and really makes you wonder what his idea of justice is is, is justice right. only that which is to be meted out to somebody else and to him and any time anybody speaks but, up but against that him, is question was also stemming from the fact that a lot of uh, his followers or uh, people at large also have this opinion against the courts. There's one opinion that we're talking about that uh, they, they are providing relief uh, to the PTI chairman, but there's also another which says that perhaps uh, the courts are coming down hard on the PTI chairman and not on the rest. And a lot of them are, of course, uh, taking in the kind of statements coming in from the PTI itself. 
Right. So I think I'll, I'll once again have to say what uh, Pitafi Sao once said on the show, and it was fantastic. Uh, in the words of former president Donald Trump, he said that if I were to shoot somebody in the middle of Times Square, my followers would still keep following me, so, something along those lines. And that's what it is with Indian followers. Uh, his jingoism and his uh, rhetoric has them spun in such a mesmerizing way that they are unable to differentiate between any logical conclusions and they continue to just follow whatever they feel Imran Khan is saying. It's it's as simple right. as that for them. He's a messiah and right. a prophet for them, which is great for him, really. Is, yes, but it's quite unfortunate. Uh, Mr. Osama, the uh, impact of the way that these procedures are going, I want to understand what Farooq earlier mentioned in terms of uh, the lower courts and the importance given to them. It seems that a lot of our issues uh, keep on being directed, especially political ones, to the Supreme Court. And whatever the, the case is, uh, however they proceed, it seems that uh, until and unless they end up and reach the Supreme Court and a verdict comes from there, nobody is really taking the rest very seriously, particularly uh, perhaps our politicians. Uh, with regards to these cases, do you think that that also is a factor and how exactly uh, will the Supreme Court or should the Supreme Court be responding to the way that uh, these uh, courts are being uh, being treated or perhaps the, the behavior that is being uh, demonstrated by the PTI leadership in response to uh, the proceedings? Um, so, so Samia, there are two aspects to it. Uh, so first, I think the biggest casualty of this last, uh, this hybrid experiment that has been going on for almost, almost 10 years now is, is our uh, judicial system, is our justice system, especially criminal justice system. Uh, so, uh, and, and as you mentioned, uh, while asking Barista Saab, that there's a certain section, in fact, a large following of PTI uh, followers, they believe that the courts are coming hard on Imran Khan and they are soft on his opponents. And a few years ago, just two years ago, it was the other way around. So that is also this, this lack of trust and the credibility that the criminal justice system, the justice system has lost, that is one of the biggest casualties that in these power games, in which if you are on the, on the wrong side of the system, then the system is going to come uh, like trapped. So the problem of opponents of Imran Khan does not appear to be, and which are on its own is a problem that he's, he's, he's constantly defying the courts, but it is like the, he's not being treated as unfairly as our leadership was. So it appears that the, that the system has lost its credibility and we need to restore its credibility because it ultimately affects the common people. It affects you, it affects me, it affects ordinary litigants. The second aspect of, yes, obviously, and this again, the superior courts, especially the constitutional courts, have been complicit in undermining their uh, subordinate judiciary. And we, we, we saw what, uh, there's a diamond report of Justice Chauka Siddiqui Saab, in which, uh, as we recently saw, that one of the TV, owners was accused of bribing the lower judiciary and then he wrote a very da damning report as a judge of the high of, of Islamabad High Court to the Chief Justice to take action that how lower judiciary was being manipulated. So obviously, uh, constitutionally speaking, it is the high courts who are supposed to uh, uh, regulate and supervise lower judiciary. So it is obviously uh, incumbent upon high courts that they should uh, supervise these courts and, and take action. It's unfortunate that the Supreme Court, which does not have much to do with lower judiciary, but the ways in during previous chief justices, especially uh, Justice Saki Basar's time, the lower courts and especially high courts, the, the way they were manipulated, it has seriously undermined. And as a result, the politicians or anyone with power, they they just go around and threatening and defying these orders, as we saw in the case of uh, Judge Zeba and other cases. So I think it has superior judiciary that has abandoned the lower judiciary and also the system itself, ultimately because the way our system is structured, it is the court of first, first instance, the court where the trial takes place, it is ultimately those lower courts. So as we saw in the Washington Sharif Panama case, that a Supreme Court judge, which is very un, which is unprecedented in common law system, that where the court of appeal, the highest court of appeal, Supreme Court, Supreme Court deputed in one of its judges to monitor the proceedings of a, a lab, a 
accountability court, which was again apart from being uh, um, unfair, was also undermining the uh, the trial courts and and the the, uh, the the court's judgment which they wanted. So it is really unfortunate, and I think the courts have to start uh, doing something. Right. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Osama Khabar-Guman, for joining us and being a part of the discussion. Sort of before we move on to the next segment, Mr. Min, last question with reference to this segment would be in terms of how we proceed uh, with these legal proceedings. It seems there's a lot of attention, again, that is being given to the PTI chairman and how uh, these cases um, are now going forward. And there's plenty of them, of course. And I understand the importance of the cases, but do you think the, that it warrants the kind of attention that is being given to him, both on media and also in the uh, public domain? Right, uh, Sana, if I were a reformer, I would have told you how to actually correct the judicial system or our media system, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm a realist, and uh, let me tell you one thing. I can't tell you how to fix them. I can tell you how to fix your life by actually coming to terms with whatever is there. And the simple answer is abandon all hope. There's no hope. Nobody is going to fix it, and it will continue to further keep on creating problems for us, right? Media is whatever echo chamber it has become. The way uh, honorable, um, I don't even want to use the word honorable because a senior honorable judge, uh, justice actually said that you are not obliged to use the word uh, honorable with the court. So I'm not going to do that because mm -hmm. I respect him a lot. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, when I tell you that I've been the greatest cheerleader uh, for the judicial system, especially the higher upper courts, uh, for, for past 15 years at least, then you have to understand where it is coming from. When you have lost me, what you have got, you have got nothing, right? Uh, I think that my, uh, my I also keep on struggling with clinical depression and uh, whatever comes from our idiot boxes, whatever comes from our system, mediocrity system, that could doesn't seem to help. So everybody who is expecting, don't expect anything because this whole phenomenon is going to play out. Uh, one thing is sure, uh, since Imran Khan Saab was elevated to the zenith of power uh, in 2011, uh, when his uh, Lahore's uh, you know, big jalsa actually took place after that, he has been building up, right? Mm -hmm. And he has been um, uh, up and up. Uh, so in that situation, what has been happening is that because it all came from the lawyers' movement, and at that time, your establishment got fractured into two halves. So no matter who is in power, uh, the, uh, whosoever is supporting Imran Khan has been doing it consistently. And there have been the people, they might lose battles, but they keep on winning, uh, you know, war. Mm. So I don't think that whatever we say, whatever we do, this whole system, this whole idea that you and I are going to get justice, I'm sorry, abandon all hope. If you okay. think that any the system works for you, it won't. Uh, the fact is that your 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 elites have found this great way of actually creating another misdirection. That you keep on fighting among yourself, the common man keeps on getting beaten up on the street. But in the end, the attention stays away from mm. the fact that there are flood of activities who are still displaced. Absolutely. That there are people who are dying of poverty that at this moment in Hebert Pastunkha census when it is being carried out every other day, police are, policemen are being killed by terrorists. And nobody is going to pay heed because we are obsessed with Imran Khan. And that will continue. Mm. That's how media actually dies. That's how systems also die. So okay, let's wait and let it play out. Get what you want and we'll see what good actually uh, uh, comes out of it. Right, and uh, we hope that uh, there is some sense towards what is more important and we're able to prioritize that and that we don't, in fact, lose hope. Uh, but, of course, uh, there seems to be uh, none at the moment. Uh, moving forward, uh, there is a lot of uh, concern regarding what is moving on uh, with the international dynamics as well. And our second segment focuses on the uh, Saudi-Iran relationship, uh, which has seen uh, and taken a new turn uh, last Friday. And since then, there has been much concerns as to what this will mean for the international community and for various countries around the world. And we're going to try and explain.
explore that in further detail. Barrister Safi, I want to first understand your take on the issue because, of course, whenever we uh, hear now uh, the concerns regarding how the situation is going to evolve, uh, there is obviously a lot of talk on the way it's going to impact the uh, war uh, with regards to uh, Yemen and then, of course, the uh, issues surrounding Iranian nuclear deal. But there's also the larger concern of the way that the international dynamics is going to unfold and whether or not uh, we're going to be exploring uh, a new way of uh, the uh, countries interacting with each other, with perhaps China taking a more central role in this. So what do you think will be the evolving dynamics? Right, thank you very much, Sana. Um, so there are various facets of the international dynamic that uh, we can talk about. But first, I just want to zero in on how very important this deal is. So the, uh, the deal that was brokered by China in Beijing and uh, signed by both the Iranian and Saudi counterparts was done secretively. Nobody knew about it, and it was it was the the uh, the developments in this deal were kept hidden for a very long time, and it's perhaps one of the biggest deals to have hit the Muslim world in decades. Just because. Uh, for the simple reason that Saudi represents the, the Sunni sect of Islam and Iran represents the Shia sect of Islam. And we see that almost every problem that is going around in the Muslim world seems to be taking place between these two sects. In Yemen, it's the Houthis who are being funded by Iran and who are fighting the Sunni government. In Iraq, we see Shia insurgencies against uh, the Sunnis. Uh, in Lebanon, it's the same thing. In Syria, it's the same thing. Everywhere we see a division between these two sects, and the and once again the onus of funding them falls upon these two states. Saudi supposedly funding the Sunni states, Iran supposedly funding the Shia factions within these states. To have them finally open up full diplomatic relations and open up embassies in these countries with China as a guarantor is an extremely important step. It's an extremely important step internationally because this is the first time China has shown its strength as a power broker within any mega region. The, this, this is a deal that impacts the entire Middle East, not just two countries. Um, it will have resounding impact on the lives of maybe over one billion people. And the fact that China managed to conduct this it, with such ease and um, and also with with such brilliance that you know they managed to enter into a deal at a time when there were many other powers interested in keeping this war going keep in mind that saudi arabia and iran are both purchasers of weapons saudi arabia especially of uh, the united states and it it holds it, the us has tremendous interest in ensuring that some sort of a conflict keeps taking place so that its military establishment industry continues to fuel the war. Uh, the same goes for Israel. The Saudi Arabia was just looking to normalize ties with Israel. I still feel like the, those ties would get normalized. But uh, uh, Israel stands as a staunch enemy of Iran. So with, with all of these things happening, what we see is that China has managed to open up a new relationship, maybe because it has leveraged its, power, its, its position as an economic power and sent its uh, one of its most brilliant diplomats, uh, Mr. Wang Yu, who is a because we, we heard uh, President Xi Jinping's statements coming in as well of the kind of role that he wants uh, China to play in the future, particularly with regards to uh, the international arena and, and then, of course, uh, as a mediator as well. But, Farooq, uh, if we look at this particular <coughs> issue, of course, the importance is there uh, with China uh, making sure that this comes about. But do you think that China would also want to be perhaps more involved in the way that uh, this relationship is now going to unfold and be part of the evolving dynamics between both the countries as well? Uh, right, uh, Sana, I think that uh, China is going to continue to play its role and that will uh, continue as well. But uh, I wanted to actually, of course, uh, you know, introduce certain elements regarding okay. how we reach here, especially because, uh, you know, uh, after 9-11, it was thought that all Muslims have to go through uh, a purity test and there were difficulties, right? Then came President Obama and uh, when Hillary Clinton was advising uh, him, uh, at that time, uh, what happened was that one gentleman called Bali Nasser was also hired. I'm quoting, uh, actually just giving you the title of his book's name, Shia Revival, How Conflicts Within Islam Will Shape the Future, right? 
that uh, Shia Sunni, they like to keep on fighting among that, that, uh, themselves. That was also the time when we witnessed Arab Spring. And that actually kind of shook the Arab world. And because of that, the Arabs got defensive and everybody started thinking that uh, uh, Iran was up to no good. Simultaneously, while uh, Iran was being sanctioned, at that time Iran was also being engaged in Iraq and then also in Syria, right? Because of that, there was this mega conflict that actually drove a wedge between the two sides. And uh, that was US policy. And then, of course, we saw that uh, when Trump actually came uh, into power, he abandoned Iran side totally. Mm. And he actually started siding with and try to actually bring together two or three, uh, you know, with disparate elements. One, Arabs. Secondly, Israel. And then the US itself, its own power. And because of that, there was this collective that kept on exerting pressure and tried to isolate Iran. But Iran, I Iran actually continued doing whatever it was. And uh, that in that situation, I think uh, right now what Biden administration is facing is clash of the two, uh, you know, worldviews. One, of course, uh, uh, stay uh, uh, with the Arab world as well, but keep on secretly using Iran to advance their own uh, objectives. And then also uh, Trump, uh, Trumpian world where Israel and Arab world actually become allies and they actually go after Iran. And there was a time, if you remember, when, uh, you know, the plane was down, the U.S. plane was down. At that time also, not U.S., but a foreign plane was down. At that time also, we thought that there could be a war between the U.S. and Iran. That did not happen, luckily. But I think because the U.S. is in a bind, uh, uh, the Arab world realized that if they are going to continue, and this is going to be a shocker. It is a shocker for Netanyahu, mm. who actually was the biggest champion of working with the Arabs, and that's why you had Abraham, Abrahamic, uh, uh, you know, accords, uh, and uh, later on, whatever is happening. So China has filled in a gap, but China has uh, does not have any ambition of its own right now because it is committed to the idea of peaceful rise. Because of that, the only thing is that it is focused on development. Iran is a very lucrative, you know, uh, access to uh, hot waters. Similarly, Arab world is also very important, and uh, China is working with them as well. And then what happened was that, uh, uh, although I have already mentioned how things actually came to be, you have, uh, uh, you know, there is uh, the talk of uh, one a Red Sea meeting that also had many leaders of the Arab world and then uh, supporters of Trump before Trump was elected and mm. Netanyahu supporters as well. There's a book called Proof of Conspiracy by Seth Abramson, which actually documents all of that. So um, I think that b all that collective is now falling apart. And China has filled in the gap, but we'll have to, um, uh, then we saw that because Trump is gone, uh, as, uh, sorry, um, uh, you know, Prince MBS perhaps staged a uh, reputation on, on the opposite side. When the midterms were taking place, something very interesting happened. Uh, the U.S. reached out to Saudi Arabia, mm. that inflation is high, and you please increase your uh, supply of oil. And because of that, there will be some control over the uh, fuel and all. Mm. And that actually did not happen. So somehow there is a realization and there is also that they have alienated, uh, you know, the um, uh, American side. Right. And America also knows that, that the other side is extreme. So naturally they have gone for China. And I think it is a smart move. It is okay. going to pay off. All right. Let's see what happens. Thank you very much, Farooq, for you. joining us. Thank you, Barita Safi, for joining us and being a part of the debate. That's all that we have uh, from the debate at the moment. There's, of course, a lot in terms of what is happening around the world and, of course, in Pakistan as well uh, that needs to be explored further. But we'll keep on doing that in the rest of our shows. That's all that we have from today. We'll see you tomorrow.